Hi, my name is Keegan, and I'm your host of Engineers and Automation. On today's episode, we're going to be talking with Vladimir Romanov. He's the co-founder of Solus PLC. We're going to talk a little bit about his background in automation. We're going to talk about why and how he started Solus PLC. We're also going to talk about building his social media presence on YouTube, as well as some of his future goals for the business. Now let's go talk automation. Welcome to today's show. I'm here with Vladimir Romanov. He's the co-founder of Solus PLC. Vlad, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. Let's just jump into it. Can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you got into the automation industry? Sure. So that's a really good question. Um, I guess to take a bit of a step back, uh, graduated back in 2013 with a engineering, electrical engineering degree from Concordia University. If anyone's familiar, that's a school in Montreal, Canada. I initially started applying pretty much everywhere. So I moved to where my parents uh, were at the time, which is Los Angeles. I didn't have a network. So I started applying, you know, through the common online portals, just sending out my resume and uh, trying to find, to be honest with you, whatever that was in electrical engineering. And so after a couple of months, I landed a job as a field engineer for Mitsubishi Electric doing uh, troubleshooting of elevators and escalators, which was interesting, but I want to say a bit more bureaucratic than let's call it hands-on. Yeah. Um, it was a unionized environment. And ultimately, as the engineer, I would show up you know, with a notepad and kind of get what happened from the installers or the mechanics and then do a lot of paperwork. They didn't really love that position, to be honest with you. And so while I was applying initially, I also had an interview process with uh, Procter & Gamble. And so the way they do it is they give you two rounds of interviews. And then based on, I guess, how you do at those interviews, they will give you a placement anywhere in the US. Um, and so I ended up being invited. And that took that process. I thought, you know, that was kind of like a done deal. They didn't call me back after the second interview, but they actually reached out six months later saying like, oh, now they have an opening for a process controls and uh, information systems engineer in uh, Auburn, Maine. And so I relocated everything from Los Angeles to Maine after visiting the site. It's it's hard to describe, right? So when I went to the manufacturing facility, it's kind of like you want to be there. You know what I mean? Like you see the robots, you see the servos, you see yeah. the automated lines that you normally only experience through like how it's made. Um, and so that's ultimately how I got into automation. And, you know, for those listening, maybe I had zero background. I had I didn't know what a PLC was. I had never seen, you know, a control panel of uh, of that nature. So I had obviously the engineering knowledge uh, that I've acquired through university, but no automation specific skills. And so they trained me up and they brought me up to speed, you know, with uh, like senior engineers. And ultimately I was sent to the, you know, like the five day Rockwell training out of a facility in uh, Massachusetts. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting and always great to get the training from the actual experts and then also through your senior level managers and other engineers. That's a great way to learn, um, especially getting your hands, hands on a product. Right. Um, so then let me ask, how did you start Solus PLC? So Solus PLC was much later. Um, and I guess to give you a, a brief timeline. So I had left PNG after three years, then moved into a role at Kraft Heinz back in uh, Los Angeles doing more, uh, maintenance work. So at that point I was a maintenance uh, manager. And so, I was exposed to a different environment than what you do in, let's say, install and control systems. Um, due to a merger in uh, 2015 between Kraft and Heinz, they decided to close down that facility in uh, 2018. So I ended up joining a very small systems integration firm that did a lot of consultant type of work and integration type of work for Kraft Heinz and Post Holdings. So I started flying between different sites and I want to say like living in hotels for better or for worse. I think that's the reality for, you know, many uh, people in systems integration. But yep. to get to your question, um, I started having, let's call it free time in hotels, right? So I started to document in many ways some of the things that I was working on in the evenings that I would come back, you know, from the facility, 
Um, and because of that, I guess I created content first, you know, just like in written form. Then I had created a tutorial and a course on Udemy and slowly but surely it started taking traction and kind of became what Solus PLC is today. Very cool. Um, and so is that then based in LA still or where where's the location then? So I was, so again, my home base was in Los Angeles. I was not doing many projects in Los Angeles. I was traveling a lot, uh, primarily to Georgia and then some facilities across the U.S. But Georgia was a very big hub. There's a peanut butter factory that I worked out of for almost like a year and a half. So I would say traveling from L.A., um, but mostly doing a lot of the Solus PLC, if you want to call it work, um, from Georgia. Interesting. And then let me ask, I do want to know, how did you come up with the name? That is a good question. So initially I looked for a name that was sort of like just general. And so I, I like to come, I guess I look at other languages. So Solus is sort of like, it's an eclipse in Latin and it, it's related to the sun. And so I just browse like random names. A lot there's, you know, like name generators on the web and I, Honestly, like I liked because the name was fairly neutral. And what I realized is that the domain was not available. And initially I wanted to focus on PLCs only. And so that's maybe also like a trap for those who are listening is, you know, if you want to, let's say, do integration type of work. And right now you might be only focused on like PLCs and HMIs. Don't necessarily call it PLC because then you have that image that makes it difficult to let's say provide like SCADA or any other platforms but at the time i wasn't necessarily thinking a lot about branding right like i was just okay. trying to put out some con content out there and making sure that i provide value on the like plc programming side yeah that's a great point and that was one of the things when i did did my name is i originally had um you know welding and robotics was in the name and when one of the few of the ideas i had but it did the same thing was like, okay, well, what about in the future if we branch out into different sectors or different areas? So that's also yep. something really good to touch on. Um, and then what types of PLCs, uh, you know, are you doing all your trainings on? Is there one specific one or do you guys do multiple different versions? So due to the nature, you know, of the work that I had done, it's predominantly, or at least like it got started as Alan Bradley, right? So both PNG and Kraft Heinz are fairly standardized on Rockwell, you know, from top down. It's negotiated, you know, at the VP levels, like way, way higher than an engineer could influence. So it was very difficult to go outside of those boundaries. Now, once I started working for a smaller systems integrator, there was a bit more leniency as to what kind of systems I could learn or employ. So it started to like grow to a larger library. Now, you'll notice if you go to Solus PLC, it's not going to be necessarily me creating the content on each one of those platforms. We have instructors that specialize, let's call it even Siemens. So now I, I can program TA Portal, but I don't have enough, let's call it, I don't have 10 years of background to be as efficient as an instructor that we have on Solus PLC. So we have different instructors for different platforms and we cover uh, Siemens, uh, PLC Next, so Phoenix Contact, we cover up to 22. We're always trying to, you know, like work on more opportunities, but those are, I wanna say like at the core. And then on the robotic side, we currently only have Fanuc, but we have an instructor that also knows like KUKA, UR and a few other platforms. So, and then is that all strictly online training? Yeah, so that's a question uh, we get a lot when companies reach out to us. I think that um, we try to position ourselves as online first. Um, and the way I guess like or our selling point is that it's not that it's meant to replace the in-person training. I think that you should still go through the materials with the physical hardware and software and sort of get that hands-on experience. And then we try to supplement that through online lessons, right? So what happens typically, and that's what happened to me, right? Like that's why I even had the intent of building something like this because I was sent, as I said, to five days uh, Rockwell training. And I think it was good, right? Like they explained to me like different functions, different features. And then a few weeks later, you ultimately don't get to use all of them. So you very quickly forget, right? So we aim to be this sort of space where after you've long forgotten the training, you can go back and rewatch something that we've made available. And I think like, again, we've seen this uh, type of transformation in other industries, right? Like the traditional software, 
I think if you wanted to learn like Python, C++, uh, Java, whatever that is, you're going to go online. You're not going to go yeah. to sit in a classroom. So I think that's what our goal was with uh, Solus PLC. Well, and, and I've seen that you guys have got a pretty big following now, especially on YouTube. Um, do you guys upload weekly, monthly? What's kind of your cadence there? And how, how do you think you establish such a large following there? Um, to be honest with you, we don't have as good of a cadence as we probably should. So as I was telling you, like initially when I was doing a lot of travel, I would be very diligent in publishing. I want to say like on a schedule, but even at the beginning, I think it was just like what made sense for the listeners, but also what was I experiencing as either a problem or a necessity in the field. And I would cover that topic and release it as soon as I could. Right. Um, and so today I want to say we're a bit behind uh, where we would like to be on the on the YouTube side, to be completely honest with you. And I guess, like, how do we figure out, like, what to cover? Well, we first, we go through the search terms, right? Like, so if you go on YouTube, you can typically find what people are looking for. Mm -hmm. But then we also talk to engineers uh, primarily from our customer base, right? So we have companies that will tell us, like, hey... Uh, and I'll give you like one example. So a couple of weeks ago, we spoke to a company that's looking to extract tags from an Allen Bradley based system into a Siemens based one, right? So on TIA portal. So an example of that would be, there's a couple of libraries that Siemens has released that use the CIP protocol. There's an ethernet based library. So long story short, you know, like we figured out like there's a need there. So we're going to create some content both in written and video form on uh, on that topic because we know there's a there's a need and it's a bit uh, troublesome to figure it out based on just reading the document right and i think like again like with content people sometimes think that maybe like we create something out of nothing but ultimately a lot of the documentation is already there like the yeah. goal is to structure the learning and to maybe simplify access to information yeah, good. And then how are you guys gathering new students, uh, new people to take your training? Mm -hmm. So we do a couple of things, right? So there's obviously the audience on YouTube and there's always, you know, like a link, like go back to Solos PLC. We have more materials. Uh, we use a couple of, I want to say like marketing instruments or tools, which are like a newsletter, right? So when you go to our website, you get to sign up, you ultimately get notified of new tutorials you also get notified of new content that we've released. Um, we also do direct outreach on the sales side, as you can probably imagine, and you probably know on the integration side, it's very difficult to reach customers directly. Yeah. Uh, but we still we still try to build those relationships, right? So calling an engineering manager and asking them like, well, what kind of problems are you facing with onboarding, let's call it new engineers, new technicians, and what might they need uh, in order to be effective at their job, right? And so we have that approach as well that is uh, a little bit more, I want to say like white glove, but also a little bit more challenging uh, from that side, from like the sales side. Yep, yep, I, I understand that. Um, let me ask this, how many students do you guys currently have in, in your uh, training programs? I mean, is it a continuously open door, removing people and moving them out, or are you just slowly building and building and building? So it's um so we run a subscription model, right? Okay. So I and I think the intent is never that people will be like retained forever. Um, the way I wanted to structure it, even like for the at the beginning, is I want people to be able to sort of take the shortest time that they need to learn. So it the reality is if you go online on Solo PLC and you buy, let's call it like a monthly subscription, it's possible for you to finish everything we have in a month, right? It's also possible that it will take you a year. So we have some people who have been there, you know, almost three years and they constantly kind of real, like get the new content and they go through it. And then we have people who finish everything in a month and move on. And I think I want it to be, like I said, I want there to be an incentive for them to want to keep learning. Yep. Hence the reason like why they're paying because so, and this is maybe like a, a slight aside when I had released some courses on Udemy and um, we, there were like some courses I was not charging for, like completely free. You know, you can go through it at your own pace. The reality is that when there's no incentive, people just don't go through it. And so I think there needs to be this balance where you charge them a little bit, but ultimately, again, the goal is not to be like a university degree, right? Like that's right. going to cost you 
30 plus thousand. Like you want to make it affordable. You want to allow people to go through it at their own pace. And some people are going to stay on, like I said, three years. And some, a lot of the people are going to take it for a month and then leave. So there's always the question of churn. And I guess like if you want to like discuss that a little bit, we're trying to release more content on more like diversified platforms so that let's say if you come in with the intent of learning, let's call it Alan Bradley or Rockwell, which let's let's imagine you learn Studio 5000 and you learn how to program like factory talk view, like HMIs, then you're exposed also like, oh, maybe like I want to take a look at Siemens. Maybe I want to take a look at PLC next, but it's not a necessity, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, interesting. Um, it it makes complete sense to me. I know there's there's a few others that are similar like that in the training sector as well. And I think if you price it right, I think that's definitely the way to go because everyone's got their own schedules. So yes. yeah, definitely makes sense. I, I did want to ask though, of these students, are you guys looking at people who, you know, be, that beginner, that intermediate, that expert level? Um, are you focusing just in one one sector of those three potentially? And that's a good question, right? So um, I don't think we have a very specific focus, to be honest with you. I think that a lot of the initial content was, I want to say, like more intermediate. But I also think that we receive comments on both sides, right? So and I'll explain what I mean by that is I would put out a tutorial on, I want to say like PID loops, right? And then someone's going to come in and comment, well, like, this is way too advanced. Like, Vlad, like you're going too fast through this. And ultimately it's because I, you know, like sometimes I can't put myself that well into the shoes of someone who's never seen that topic before. Right. And then on the flip side, you know, on that same, let's call it video, as I gave it as an example, someone will come in and say like, well, like you're only exploring like the basic features of that function. I want to see the PIDE setup. Right. Yeah. And so it's almost like you can't please everyone all at once. But I think if you're looking, I guess, if you're asking that question from the point of like, we're looking to create like more content, there's a larger audience, I think, for uh, more basic content. But there is a, I think, like a higher impact where you create the more advanced con uh, content, right? Like, so there's less competition and ultimately not uh, many people like cover that. So I think for the customers that we have, you know, that are working at companies and that understand like and have some engineering background, we tend to create like very advanced videos. And then let's say like for for YouTube, that is like the, the free platform, we tend to create more like basic yeah. uh, training that sort of serves like as a funnel, right? Like, so you get some yeah. interesting information, you're trying to get started in PLCs and we want to encourage that. But then if you want to, uh, you know, like build your career you have a bit more like invested in the space, you were looking for something like more solid, then it's going to be, uh, you know, like the paid and like more advanced uh, courses. And that's a, that's a great sales funnel too, right there, right? You get out some of the easier stuff for free, then you turn around and okay, if you like that, you want to get a little bit more advanced, here's, here's our platform. So great yeah. business model. Um, what, what do you like about being a business owner? What's, what's some of the positives? Um, I think the biggest positive is flexibility, right? Like at the end of the day, and we talked uh, about this off stream a little bit. So I now have a six month old and I certainly require being able to uh, take time for her. And, you know, like as a small business owner, you can do that, right? Uh, whereas if you're working a nine to five, it becomes very difficult. Obviously, it's possible depending on what you're doing, but uh, certainly the flexibility is um, it is unlike anything else uh, when it comes to a small business. And of course, you um, you know, the expression is you eat what you kill, right? Like, so you have to sort of like work on your own contracts. You need to like figure out some of these strategies. And I think it's um, maybe it's a mistake that some uh, business owners make where I think they're a really good expert, but then they don't enjoy those like little business um, aspects that come with it. Yeah. Uh, but I actually like I like it, right? Like I like the interactions. I like to like be able to negotiate for myself. I like to be able to decipher uh, the world of like sales and accounting. I think that is uh, very interesting to me. Yeah, cool. And I do want to touch base again real quick. Um, I forgot to ask this earlier. What about uh, your, your students? Are a lot of them uh, from the States, from Canada, or are you kind of reaching out globally as well? So based you know, like again, on the like a very, I want to say, like good 
uh, foundation on the Rockwell side, it almost like silos us to North America. Okay. So definitely, you know, like US and Canada are, I want to say like the biggest markets. Yeah. But now that we have other offerings, you know, we see people from Europe, we see people from uh, Middle East. And so, it, but I want to say like predominantly it is uh, North America. Very cool. Um, and since we are just now hitting Q4 here, have, how have you been doing this year? I mean, how is business performing? Did you set some goals for the year? Have you met those goals? Um, how, how are you doing there? Um, we are always very ambitious with the goals, um, but I will tell you that I think the client or the economic climate on the manufacturing side is a little bit different this year than it was last year. I think that the budgets have certainly tightened up a little bit. And uh, as you can imagine, training is uh, not, I, I want to say like it, it is a necessity in, in a way, but at the same time, it is, um, how to say it, like it's sometimes nice to have uh, more than anything else. It so we're certainly to always seeing... get cut first, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So <laughs> I think a lot real. of companies are yeah. still automating, right? Like everyone's putting new machinery on the plant for new yeah. robotics. But when it comes to training, uh, the budgets are a little bit smaller. So We've set really ambitious goals. I think we're going to be growing based on the previous year, but we're not necessarily going to be like doubling or tripling the business. So I, you know, like I joke about this a little bit, but in a way I have a lot more flexibility, but at the same time, you know, when I was traveling 90% of the time and working kind of 80 hour weeks as an integrator, I was making more money. Right. So I think yeah. that there is this component of reality where um, depending on obviously like what you want in life, uh, you will have to like make different uh, different choices, different sacrifices, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then before we wrap up here, where can people find you? How can they get in touch with you? How can you know visit your website? How can people reach out to you if they they want some more information? Sure. So I think the easiest way if they want to reach out to me uh, directly is going to be on LinkedIn. Um, but then, you know, in terms of what we've discussed, so solusplc.com is obviously the website that I run. If they want to see um, the kind of materials that we've put together, there's a lot of tutorials there that they can kind of browse through and read uh, without any payments. And if they're interested in the courses, happy to chat about that. I also, as you know, run the Manufacturing Hub podcast. And so we do a live yeah. every Wednesday on different topics in the industry if they want to check that out. Um more than uh, happy to answer some questions. We bring in different guests as well with uh, which we have different conversations in uh, uh, high level topics in manufacturing. Yeah, great, great. Well, thank you for being here. We'll put all that information in the description below. So go ahead and check it out. So if you guys enjoyed today's episode, please give us a like, comment, share, and don't forget to subscribe. And we hope that you join us here next time on Engineers and Automation. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me.